Figuring out which direction to go is the first but the most crucial step of discipleship because Jesus calls us to follow him. In the first chapter of Mark, Jesus calls ordinary fishermen to follow him into the great unknown. And of course, they get up immediately and follow him. At first, everything seems to be going great for Jesus. Everything he does is a great success. He goes and he teaches in the synagogue to great acclaim. He heals a leper. Then he goes and he heals Simon Peter's mother-in-law. Verse 28 of chapter 1 tells us that his fame grew throughout the region of Galilee. Everything seems to be going great. And then all of a sudden, a roadblock. And not just one, but one after another in chapters 2 and 3. First of all, Jesus finds himself healing a man who cannot walk. And there are religious leaders present who are quite bothered when they hear Jesus say that the man's sins are forgiven. And then, and then Jesus is found associating with some disreputable people. And again, the religious leaders are upset. They don't like Jesus' associations. They're bothered by the fact that he and his disciples do not fast according to the religious customs of the day. They don't like the fact that he and his disciples play fast and loose with the rules concerning the Sabbath day. And then there's this really confusing scene with Jesus and his mother and his brothers. They've come to observe him, and they think he's losing his mind. And so they try to take him home with them. It seems like all of a sudden, Jesus cannot help escaping conflict. The reality of the life of discipleship is that it is full of conflict. It is difficult. In fact, as soon as you and I decide that we are going to be disciples, we will begin to encounter people, things, situations, forces that will try to distract us, obstruct us from walking fully on the way. Resistance is inevitable. It will happen. And so resistance is our word of the week, our English word of the week. There are two ways of resisting the gospel of Jesus. One kind of resistance is of the person who really understands and gets what Jesus is all about, but decides that it's just not worth the sacrifice. Another kind of resistance comes up in the community of the righteous, we might call them, people who are steeped in their traditions and convicted in their possession of the truth. Their resistance to the message of Jesus is justified because it doesn't line up with their doctrines and it doesn't square with their view of reality. If we could draw a clean line between these two kinds of resistance on the part of the sinners on the one hand and the righteous on the other, we would have to say that it's that second group that has caused more trouble in history. It was true in Jesus' day and it's true in ours as well. Jesus challenges us to come to terms with the extent to which our own religious conviction, even more so perhaps than our sinfulness, puts up resistance to the truth of God's kingdom in our lives. John points out the resistance that the religious put up to the way of Jesus. This is a recurring theme throughout the Gospels. Time after time, it is those who are the most religious, the priests, the scribes, the elders, the Pharisees, who present the biggest challenge to Jesus and his way. But Jesus faces other kinds of resistance in chapters 2 and 3 of Mark, and he receives some of the stiffest resistance from the last place we'd expect it, members of his very own family. Didn't his mother really know who he was? Didn't his brothers at least respect him to, to understand what he was trying to do? The sad truth is, very often, we receive the most resistance to our following Christ from the members of our very own family. I'm not sure why this happens exactly. Perhaps family members feel as if this will undermine the status quo of the family. Perhaps the family members fear that they will lose a part of their own. Perhaps they feel that their own importance will be diminished. On a more personal note, my wife Leah and I have experienced this phenomenon for ourselves. When we decided to become missionaries to Cameroon, we discovered that Leah's parents offered some of the most resistance to what we felt we were called to do. I often preached outdoors, but sometimes the town people tried to chase me away by throwing rocks and eggs at me. 
Once a farmer drove a herd of cows right through the middle of the crowd to disrupt my sermon. It worked. Ooh. I was even dragged by my hair through the countryside one night in a heavy rain by an angry mob that wanted to kill me. I guess my sermon went too long. It seems to me that there's just one simple rule about discipleship. When we truly decide to walk in the right way, we will face resistance from the self-righteous, from family members, from friends, from the world. The world is one way of referring to the vast range of forces that conspire to keep us from the way of Christ. Perhaps the best way to think about the world is to think of it as a vast system that makes the world operate the way that it works. Have you ever tried to change something or tried to help someone only to have somebody resist you by saying, oh, you can't do that, you can't change the way things are? That's just the way the world works. That's the way the world is. Often the greatest resistance we face is from the sad inertia of the world. But perhaps now is the time to ask an expert about resistance. The one thing that you and I can expect on the way is resistance. After all, Jesus experienced it, and so should we. It should never be a surprise. But like Jesus, we can be prepared for it. We can, for example, turn away wrath with a soft answer. We can remember that our journey is a marathon, not a sprint. And we can remember Jesus' own promise that we will never travel alone. See you next time on the way.